Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, everybody. Scott Luton here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. We have an excellent conversation teed up today as we're going to be talking with a supply chain leader doing big things across industry, especially in the procurement space. So stay tuned as we have quite an intriguing conversation in store. Now, with that said, I want to welcome in our featured guest here today. Our guest is a graduate of the legendary supply chain management program at Michigan State University. He then went on to earn his MBA from the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University. And since then, he's gone on to spend more than 20 years at an iconic global technology leader. So please join me in welcoming Jason McIver, Vice President of Services Procurement at Dell Technologies. Jason, how are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me, Scott. You bet. Really enjoyed uh, a few minutes with you in Vegas at the Reverse Logistics Association Annual Conference. We may touch on that a little later on, but great to have you here today. So, so Jason, I, I want to, before we get into uh, what you're doing at Dell, all the big things you and your teams are up to, let's get to know you a little better. So tell us, where did you grow up and, and give us some anecdotes about your upbringing? Yeah, so I grew up outside of Detroit. Uh, I grew up in a small town called Northville. Uh, different now than when I was there, a lot of dirt roads and whatnot. My high school was off Eight Mile. So okay. in the movie, you have, uh, I grew up off that road, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> My dad was an executive at Ford. So I grew up in automotive land. Wow. And uh, I thought I was going to be an auto guy as well and took a different path and came to Austin and have worked for Dell ever since. Man, that is awesome. Uh, so um, with your father, an executive at Ford, and you said you lived in that automobile land, what's what's one thing that may stick out? Was he getting calls at all, you know, uh, all times of night? What was the pressure like? Or, you know, what'd you do as kids when maybe he took you into the office? Yeah, it was great. He There was no email way back when, right? <laughs> so he wrote a lot of white paper position papers on ideas on how to save money, uh, improve processes, and you'd constantly see him working on these things at home mm. and it stuck with me. And so you kind of find myself tinkering with these different ideas over time. And it kind of takes me all the way back to the eighties when uh, he was doing the same thing at Ford. Oh, that's awesome. That is awesome. Uh, lots of stories I'm sure to tell there. Uh, he needs to write a book. How long <laughs> did he spend at Ford, Jason? I think it was 32 years. Man. Okay. Um, well, let's, let's switch gears for a second. Let's talk about uh, when you're not, when you, when the email is not chasing you these days uh, at Dell, when you got some free time, what do you do? Yeah. So I'm an avid runner. I've done three half marathons this year already. And so race season is winding down. So I'll start to uh, reduce my miles and I have a goal list and uh, my goal is for the year is to learn tennis. So I've never been a tennis player and I'm um, off and running on lessons and being humbled uh, regularly <laughs> each week. <laughs> who knows? Maybe I'm interviewing the future Yvonne Lindell or I Lindell, know. Lindell, who, who knows? <laughs> um, all right. Finally, before we get into uh, more heavy lifting related to uh, your, your leadership role at Dell, you're a big, as I mentioned on the front end, you're an alum of Michigan State University. Uh, we're big sports buffs around here. What's your favorite sports moment in Michigan State uh, history? Yeah, I got a, a couple that stick out. In uh, 05, the uh, Sweet 16 games and grade A games were here in Austin. And I got to see Michigan State beat Kentucky, then beat Duke to go to the Final Four, wow. which was pretty, pretty great. And then uh, the best one was I actually went with my dad in uh, 2015 to the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. And we were down 21 points in the fourth quarter to Baylor, came back and won by one. So uh, you don't get many games better than that. That's awesome. That is awesome. And uh, speaking of the sport of supply chain management, gosh, Michigan State has been turning out the talent for quite some time uh, there. Um, okay. So speaking of that, uh, before we get into what you do at Dell, uh, tell us about a previous role or two that you had that really shaped your worldview. Yeah. Probably a, a different direction than when you ask this to other people. Uh, the first role I took was actually 
uh, with Harley Davidson. I was interning with them out of Michigan State. I went to Milwaukee. I had never worked for a large company, you know, all bushy tailed and bright eyed. <laughs> and, uh, it, but for me, it was the moment of realizing that I didn't have to go the path of automotive. I could go my own path and blaze my own trail. And going to Milwaukee and enjoying the experience there so much, it opened the door for me to have bigger opportunities later, obviously, with Dell. And if I didn't do that, I don't think I would have picked the path I picked. I think I would have gone uh, Ford or GM or one of those. I love that. Uh, so I've got to go back to your father uh, who spent, you know, um, had a long, successful career in automotive. When you let him know your plans, oh, yeah. Yeah, what, yeah. how do you react? <laughs> Uh, it, it, yeah, I didn't talk to him for a couple months after that. <laughs> really? I, you know, it's and it's and for people listening, it's probably one of those things you're like, well, why wouldn't he do that? Well, my grandfather, my uncle, my aunt, my mom, you, you go down through my family line, either direct automotive or automotive suppliers. They were all there. And wow. so it, it made no sense for me to go to this crazy technology company uh, in 1999. Why would you do that when you can go work in automotive? So the, the Harley Davidson experience for me opened my eyes, opened the door to that. I love and, that. and I think the, the second one would be, I took uh, a stint outside of supply chain. I wanted to start managing larger organizations and teams. And one of the ways to do that within Dell is you could go sales or you could go into tech support. So I went in tech support and anytime anybody can get the opportunity to get closer to the customer, man, what a great experience that was for me. Uh, dealing with, you know, situations that are very complex, uh, tough when, you know, customers are in bad places, but being able to get them to a place where, uh, you know, they're anti your company and changing that around and getting them to be advocates for it because what you and your teams can do for them, mm. uh, you know, it's brand building and, you know, personally change some of my outlook on all the supply chain issues and challenges we have. Uh, it interjected empathy and creative solutions into some of the things that we're even doing today. Mm, well said, well said. Um, and by the way, quite a decision for as exciting as the automotive industry has, has been certainly since 99 and the tough times still yeah. to have joined the Dell, Dell team in the technology era and do some of the things, be a part of some things they've done over the last 20 plus years. Uh, pretty exciting. Um, okay. Speaking of Dell, I'm sure everybody and their brother and sister know what Dell does, but how would you describe the company? And then let's talk about your role. Yeah, I mean, we, we are a technology company that looks for end-to-end -end solutions for our customers. Clearly, we uh, sell everything from consumer notebooks all the way through the data center and high-end storage. Uh, we're getting into telco, which uh, some people might not be aware of, which is extremely exciting. And we're building out a great as a service solution for our customers uh, if they don't want to spend the capital allocation up front. So uh, really exciting place to be. Um, it, it's one of those companies that, uh, you know, I believe will stand the test of time. It's going to do wonderful things for our customers. All right. With it, Let okay. me ask you if I can, Jason, really quick. I, I love that. And I bet a lot of folks don't know about that telco thing you mentioned. But for the organization to stand the test of time, culture, you know, is it plays a big, in my opinion, at least plays a big part in that. You've been there quite some time. Let me ask you a little, little, little surprise question. What's the one thing about the Dell culture that is so fundamental to its success? Yeah, I don't, I don't think you can stay at a company for 23 plus years uh, and not appreciate the culture. And really what it comes down to is the people. Uh, there are tremendous people at the company. I know most companies would say that. Uh, but one of the things I get from people that have left or left and come back and you ask why, and it just keeps coming back to the same thing. We're really mm. high quality people. And, uh, you know, as you look at the answers to various questions, a lot of it ties back to that simple thing, right? In the world we live in today, if you can't work end to end through problems, or if your company's working in silos, you're not going to be as effective as you need to be. And Dell has that culture of what's good for the company might not be good for Jason McIver mm. in this situation. But at the end of the day, if we keep doing the right things, all good things will come to the people that are making the right choices and decisions. And that's true because not every day is sunny on us, right? There's 
you, you've, you've seen over the last 20 years, right? There are roller coasters a little bit, but the direction is clear, right? We continue to improve through ups and downs. We continue to evolve and you have to do that and you can't do it without wonderful people. Well, man, well said. I love that uh, 100% with you on the points you're making there. And to one of the things you, one of the last things you mentioned there, you know, it's easy for good partners to celebrate that partnership, you know, when, when on the good days, right? When you've hit yeah. the home run and, and things are good. And, and, but man, when you, when your relationship partnership, your tenure at a company can endure those tougher days and you get through on the other side. And there, there's there's a there's a secret sauce there that's that's just uh, irreplaceable. Um, so let's talk about your role. So when yeah. it comes to services procurement uh, at Dell Technologies, what does that mean? What does it mean? Uh, so so you think about Dell and all of the wonderful things from a supply chain standpoint that we have done over the years. And I don't know how many books have been written. We'll say ten thousand or more. Right? I mean, there's so many books that have references to Dell supply chain. All of that work has nothing to do with I do. <laughs> so I work on the back end. So when you talk about back ends, reverse logistics, supply chain, when your computer breaks, when your data center has an issue, hopefully that doesn't happen very often. But when it does, my team is procuring all of those components to support all of our global warehouses mm. and all the dispatches that go out. So uh, Clearly, right, wide, a little bit wide ranging. We touch every line of business, right? We reference telco as so that kind of comes into play, uh, but from school districts to, to you name it. So um, we are in the middle of all of that, uh, hundreds of suppliers, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of spend, a uh, lot of impact. And it's good, right? Because the things that we do make a difference. You can actually tangibly see uh, when we do our job really well, customers are satisfied. I love that. Uh, so on the reverse side, um, are you and your team part of, you know, kind of optimizing uh, the end of life cycle for products, uh, you know, any returns and stuff like that? Yeah, we live it. Right? <laughs> I mean, that, that, is, that is the core of what we do. Um, we don't, the last button we ever want to push is a purchase order. If we can recycle it, reuse it, repair it, whatever that may be, that's better for the environment, it's better for our customers, and it's better for our financials. And so we try to make sure that we optimize the heck out of that. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of challenges within our business to do that on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And so, go ahead. Well, uh, I, may be, I may be asking the question that you're about to share, because I was going to get into priorities, maybe along uh, some of those lines for 2022, but I didn't want to shortcut your answer there. No, no, go ahead. We, we can jump into that. So, so let's, let's talk. Um, it, there's so much there, so much from what I'm hearing about you and what your team is doing, so much opportunity, so much to get done. Uh, we live it, as you say. Um, so what are, if you had to pinpoint a couple of priorities uh, for your aspect of the enterprise here in 2022, what would those be? I'm going to list out a few, and this is a, this is a delicate one, right? Because uh, strategic priorities. But, but I'll, I'll try to talk about it at a high level, and hopefully that uh, will get you to... Uh, it's just me and you, Jason. Jason. It's just I me know. and you. <laughs> me and you and a bunch of friends. There is a term that Gartner phrased, and this goes back maybe a year ago, called hyper-automation. And really what the core of that term means is, how do you automate your core processes and things you potentially you haven't done before? How do you bring in things like data, data science, um, AI, ML, RPA, you know, all these different kind of tools and uh, whatnot to, to bring, I guess, solutions in places of, of people. And yet there's a people component to it, to how do you upskill your people so they can do more strategic work for you as you automate pieces or components or potentially all of their roles. And so there's a big effort between now and we'll call it 2030 to go do that. How do we automate the world that we're living in, whether that's from planning to uh, core tactical procurement items um, and whatnot. So as you kind of build that out, then the second piece is how do you add in through all of this new knowledge you have with data science, uh, transparency for our customers so it's seamless for them. They have clear updates on whatever they wanna see within the, the supply chain or where their product or part is 
And so you add in data with transparency and ultimately you're going to get to a, a better place overall. Mm. Now from a more tactical level, that's kind of strategic high level sure. generally where we're going, right? And I think most companies are going in that direction. Why, if they're not, they're probably going to be behind them and maybe not exist in 2030. Mm. The second piece is, is more tactical. And, and I bring this up too, because we're not the only industry challenged with this. And there's a saying that we have within Dell is we want more than our fair share of supply. And the topic I'm bringing up is component shortages and limitations within the supply chain. They're real. Uh, we all know that you see on the news, right? Automotive plants shutting down or, or whatnot. Uh, no one's immune to the challenges that are out there around IC chips or LCD panels or whatever that may be, hard drives, you name it. And so we continue to you know, face that challenge, work through it, uh, partner with our suppliers, get the allocation we need. And, uh, and that's not an easy one, right? It's not for the faint of heart either. Wow. I love how you tackle that head on and you're transparent about because it, 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 no one is immune. And we've seen that prove itself time and time again, even the most resilient companies. We've seen, speaking of automotive, when it comes to semiconductors, we've seen some very innovative relationships uh, come Absolutely. about in recent months, which is really cool to see. Um, I want to go back to something. You talked about upskilling, right? We, we yeah. just had a discussion, Jason, uh, via live stream within the last few days where um, there was a lot of rallying around a key point of, you know, while or, a lot of organizations, according to one survey we were citing, a lot of organizations are trying to get around the talent shortages with cross training, right, and, and enabling their uh, team to do more and do, do different functions. However, there was a great statement made that that cross functional training is not upskilling; it's, it's not interchangeable uh, necessarily, and um, and in, in a lot of employees these days, team members these days, folks coming in in the industry want to do more, but also want to learn more, right? But it, from your purview, what does any of that mean? And, and what's your take on upskilling versus that cross-functional training? Yeah, I mean, uh, talent is, there, there's a war on talent. And if you want to be successful, you better go get it. And, and if you have it, you better keep it. Mm. And the question kind of comes down to, well, how do you do that? And you have to be flexible in this environment. The pandemic opened up the aperture on what companies should be thinking about and doing uh, around their people. And so you're, you're hearing companies today saying we're flexible, but you have to be in the office three days a week. <laughs> right. Well, that's not flexible. And so Dell's saying, we're not doing that. You can be flexible and come up with your own schedule. That could be zero days a week. It could be five days a week. That's on you to decide. And so uh, we're trying to navigate that uh, potentially a little bit different than other companies. Mm. Uh, obviously, you want to create, uh, people always go back to money. Money is one piece of it, uh, right. but it is not the only one, right? I mentioned uh, that, you know, a million Dell books written on uh, the front end supply chain, zero written on the back end. Well, we live in the Wild West, but it's not the Wild West of the Billy the Kid. It's the Wild West of Westworld. And so can you create and do you have the autonomy and ability to dream big and help us build out some of the solutions we want for tomorrow? And so creating that through, you know, interesting things and a lot of people love these topics like sustainability or whatnot. How do you integrate some of these things in to be uh, more ingrained, not only in what we do, but how we do it? Right. And so can you paint the picture on the vision of what you want? And the autonomy the individual have, pay a, a fair salary, right? The market's obviously evolving and moving up and then creating a work environment that it breeds flexibility, allows you to go get talent wherever talent may be and not necessarily here in Austin or, or wherever that individual may be. And so that's kind of the Dell vision of how we're going about it. And uh, we'll continue to evolve that to make sure that we're getting our fair share of that talent. So on the reverse side, the reverse logistics side, you, you said, quote, the wild, wild west of Westworld. I love that versus Billy the Kid's wild west. That is such a great analogy. I'm going to completely steal that from you, Jason. So uh, maybe I owe you some uh, some um, uh, license fees. I don't know. We'll work that out afterwards. I'll go through your agent. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about um, – uh, I love I love a lot of the visionary elements you bake into your responses to what I ask you about. 
Uh, I'm curious to know, especially with that in mind, key lessons learned from these last couple of years. Yeah, I'm going to stick on the people point uh, right now. I don't think you can win in today's world without talent. Um, if you want to get things done, you need really good people to do it. Uh, don't underestimate the importance of having a very, very strong team. And, you know, I've been blessed with that uh, over my career and especially right now. So I think my Eureka moment just kind of doubles down on making sure that your team is front and center and you're focused on that and your people. Hmm. The second piece is around resiliency. If you look at some of the strategies that uh, we've deployed over time, they weren't necessarily resilient focused, right? You, you, opt, you can optimize in different areas. You can optimize around cost or uh, customer flexibility or, or whatnot, but not always is the solution that you're picking the most resilient uh, in the environment. And what happens when you get a pandemic uh, that no one really understood or ever could have even dreamed was coming. Right. And you plop that down on top of us, and then you add in component shortages and a bunch of other you know world uh, issues that we're facing. Uh, resiliency becomes a huge, huge issue if you can't adapt and figure out how to be more resilient. And so we live in that world right now. And all of our activity isn't just around how do we get the lowest cost it is how do we make sure that we're the most resilient that we can be? Because at the end of the day, if you're not, your customers will feel it. And if they feel it, they'll move. Yeah. And we don't, we want to be sticky. We mm -hmm. want customers to want to be with us. And, and that's one of the ways we're trying to deliver on that promise. Quick follow up there. The uh, uh, we like saying the word, the phrase, when we hear of resilience, your anti-fragility. Uh, what, how strong is the organizational anti-fragility? Um, how have you approached, you know, there's so many timeless truths and approaches and best practices that, I mean, nothing was immune to being questioned over the last couple of years, but you know, what's your, how does that, what does that taught you from a leadership standpoint? You know, when we, when we've seen all these new challenges, right. To your point that folks are still trying to understand they're moving, evolving, and of course, we still got the old challenges related to, to you name it, doing business. How, what has that taught you as a leader? Um, you can't fake caring, right? So you, you have to make sure that you're a caring leader through it. Uh, there's Through the pandemic and whatnot, people had a lot going on in their lives uh, with people actually having COVID, uh, their family members, people being at home, their kids right. running around their uh, desk and whatnot. Playing Fortnite. Playing Fortnite, you name it, right? All, we, all of us have gone through all those things. And if you haven't, then uh, congratulations. I don't know how you accomplished that one. But, but the, the truth is all of us have gone through a lot. So there, there's a level of empathy and emotional intelligence that I think all leaders had to adapt and, and really bring on if they wanted to continue to be the leader that they wanted to ultimately be. So I think, you know, that just, I, I keep circling back to it. And I know this is focused on supply chain, but if you want to have a good supply chain, you better uh, have good leadership principles in general. I'm with you and, and, and love and take care of those people. Uh, they, they're the ones that make it happen, even in this technology era where it's, it's so fascinating and intriguing to see all the innovation in that space. But man, the people still make uh, global trade and supply chain happen. Let's, let's shift gears a minute. Uh, yeah. We met in person for the first time at the Reverse Logistics Association event out in Las Vegas. Tony Sheroda, who also, you may you probably already know this, Jason, he was born and raised in the D Detroit area. Uh, so I bet y'all have exchanged maybe a few stories there. Yeah, Tony's um, a great guy. He really is. Uh, so clearly you and the Dell team uh, is committed and are thought leaders within the RLA ecosystem and community. Uh, you help support these learning opportunities for industry so that, um, that all of us, whether you're on the reverse side or the forward side, if you're in global business, we can get better at reverse logistics, returns, management, um, circularity, you name it. Why? What is, what's in it for, from your uh, vantage point for you, your team, and, and ultimately Dell? Yeah, I think a, a simple answer would be, you know, uh, my boss, Tom Mars, on the board or, on, or one of the board members. Uh, we've been going uh, for years, but, but really it comes down to uh, in business, if you ever think you're the smartest person in the room, then go find a different room. Mm. 
And a lot of what reverse logistics opens the door for Dell is smaller companies that have unique or innovative ideas that they might not get in the door with us through the normal way. You can go to these conferences, see what they're uh, doing and projecting and figure out if you could bring that into the business. Because we don't want to be the Titanic. We want to be a nimble speedboat. And even though we're a gigantic company, the more nimble we can be, the better we'll be against our competition and the more value we'll bring to our customers. So conferences like RLA, and there's others as well, we view a ton of value in. We're going to continue to invest in it over time. Uh, we bring people and we bring big ears to listen to what people have to say. Love it. Love it. Uh, all right. And, and speaking of which, of course, we, we are conducting the Reverse Logistics Leadership Series right here at Supply Chain Now with our friends in conjunction with Tony and the Reverse Logistics Association. You can learn more about them at rla.org. Okay. Uh, you know, I've asked you a couple of times about lessons learned, Eureka moments. You've already shared a few. Um, for some reason, I've got you down three times. I'm going to ask you three times about Eureka moments. Um, but before we offer up the opportunity for how folks can connect with you, um, you know, Jason, when you reflect back, whether it's your conversations you had in Vegas, um, you know, first, you know, here we're, uh, as we're recording this, we're uh, approaching April already, April of 2022. Yeah. Um, anything else that you, that's really hit you like an epiphany uh, and made you stop and think about just what we do day in and day out. Well, I'm going to take one more stab at this. What else, anything else comes to mind? Yeah. You think about it, March, 2020, the world changed for all of us and uh, having a global team watching it right in December, I started hearing about this thing called COVID in China. And I wish I would have sold all my stock at that time and waited for that. But, but the truth that you don't, you still don't understand actually what's coming at you. So over the last two years have been a crazy whirlwind for most companies, uh, no one's immune to it. But those challenges bring innovation and you can't replicate when something happens and it could be for another company, a cyber attack or whatever it may be. But when challenges come, think people rise up and great processes, tools and ideas come to the forefront and I feel like from a company standpoint, we, we went five years in advance over the last two years. Right. And I'm not sure that would have happened, truly, if the pandemic didn't happen. And so there are silver linings through all of this that really have helped us as a company advance. Um, and I'm sure other companies probably feel the same, right? And that's in all different spaces, whether it's data science, digital transformation, uh, process automation, uh, how we train our people, you name it, right? All Retail. Yeah. yeah. You name it. Um, I, I agree with you. I think when we look back, cause we're, you know, industry, uh, schools, leaders, you name it, they're going to be studying these last few years for a long time to come. I believe one of the reasons is to your point, the silver linings and just how, uh, real innovation change, really changing how we do things, how we design things, um, you know, how we interact with customers, how we meet our customers and our employees, where, where they are. That's uh, right. So many silver linings uh, related. And, and, you know, that helps us get through the bad times uh, as we make industry stronger and more durable. And, and as Minda Hartz put, said it once with us uh, a few episodes back, we make work work for everyone. And, yeah. you know, that's, but that was a, yeah. uh, what a great quotable quote, um, halfway through the pandemic. So um, the truth is customers want choice, right? Right. And the, the choices before were a and B mm. and now they're the whole alphabet. <laughs> and so you kind of look at these things and say, you have to adapt as a company. Dell had to adapt. And if you don't adapt, you're going to die. And when, when you're put to that level, uh, or think through that level, you have to rise up. You have right. to rise up and people have, and our companies have, and it's really been wonderful to see and be a part of outside right. of the extra gray hair. <laughs> well, um, people, that, that was, what a great note to wrap on because people have risen to the challenge in so many different ways. And we're, we're so grateful, you know, that, that uh, global supply chain workforce forward and reverse have, have, mm. have, has helped our society across the globe 
um, protect that psyche and get through these last couple of years. So thanks uh, for you and the Dell team. So speaking of which, how can folks, uh, Jason McIver, how can folks connect with you and Dell? Yeah, the, the best way is really LinkedIn, right? So Jason McIver, LinkedIn, um, and we'll respond back to you and we'll go from there. It's just that easy. It's just that, that easy. easy. Um, Jason, really appreciate your time. I appreciate what you've shared here today. I love the transparency in your responses. And again, that visionary element. Uh, it's almost like you're speaking supply chain poetry, uh, Jason, <laughs> with us here on Supply Chain Now. Big thanks, Jason McIver, Vice President of Services Procurement at Dell Technologies. Thanks so much, Scott. You bet. Okay, folks, hopefully you enjoyed this, this frank conversation as much as I have. I'm so glad we're able to uh, get Jason on the docket after uh, meeting him out in Vegas. Again, it's part of the Reverse Logistics Association Annual Conference and Expo. Um, hey, if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to find Supply Chain Now wherever you get your podcast from so you don't miss anything, any other conversations like this. But most importantly, hey, uh, Scott Lute, on behalf of the entire Supply Chain Now team, do good, give forward, be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you next time right back here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at SupplyChainNow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts. And follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now. Supply Chain Now.